Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today we have a really exciting talk coming up and today's presenter will be Amy Kutsiewski who is an associate professor at the Department of Radiology at Weill Cornell Medicine in Computational Biology of Cornell University. So for the past decade Amy has been interested in understanding how the human brain works and in order to better diagnose, prognose and treat neurological disease and injury. The COCO Lab's main focus is on using quantitative methods, including machine learning applied to multimodal neuroimaging data to map brain behavior relationships. The lab's overall goal is to develop individualized therapies that can boost neural recovery mechanisms and support recovery after neurological disease or injury. So it's really exciting to have her here. So the presentation today is entitled Biological and Artificial Neural Networks. And Amy, I'm really excited to have you here. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. And the stage is yours. for that uh, generous uh, introduction. And I'm so happy to be here today. Um, I, I went through some of your speakers and I was super excited to see uh, some of my colleagues and other people that I've seen give talks. Uh, so hopefully I can um, hold a candle to their talks as well. Uh, and uh, so Andreas uh, kind of told you about what I do. Um, and today I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about something that I've been doing recently that's a little bit of a departure uh, that seems like it's a little bit of a departure from what I normally do, but at the end, hopefully I'll bring it back around um, and convince you that it's a consistent uh, form of um, uh, research. <laughs> uh, so, so all the work that I'll be discussing today um, has been uh, done by this group of people here, um, including my staff associate, Keith Jamison, my PhD student, Zijin Gu, who's at um, EC Cornell, and Menakshi Kolsa, who's also uh, a um, almost graduated uh, PhD student um, of Mert Sebanchus, who's my uh, other colleague um, that, that works in the ECE department, or actually is at Cornell Tech, he just moved, and in the radiology department, my home department. So, uh, so this is a great group of people, and uh, hopefully I will like the work that we've been doing recently. Um, so first, the funding and disclosure. Some of this uh, work that I'll present today has been funded by this um, Intercampus Pilot Grant Award. Um, and then another disclosure is that I'm a scientific advisory board member at Neuronasal. Um, and so let's just dive in. So uh, maybe some of you already know this, uh, but biological neural networks um, are consistent of these units called neurons. Um, so here's a little schematic of a neuron uh, where you have the cell body and the dendrites um, and the, the axon that reaches out very far and then uh, uh, connects to other regions or uh, other neurons um, with the axon terminals across these synapses. And so this is a beautiful picture. I love these. These are called brain bows um, and they're ways, uh, and they're, each of these colors is a neuron. Um, and you can kind of see this very complicated pattern, uh, very complex uh, pattern of neurons um, interacting with each other and, and um, in the cortex of the human brain. And so uh, a lot of work has been looked at, looking at uh, mapping functions um, in the human brain and trying to figure out where in the brain things are uh, represented. Um, and so this was actually a screenshot of a talk from Nancy Canwisher, who's kind of the godmother of uh, uh, brain representations and vision neuroscientist science. And uh, it was, it's kind of a really cool uh, way of looking at these brain regions that have been mapped to specific functions. Um, so things like uh, grasping or thinking about other people's minds, uh, uh, looking at um, how the brain responds to visual stimuli, including places, faces, color, texture, uh, bodies um, and, and words. Um, and so there's a lot of work looking at trying to map these uh, representations in the brain um, and figure out how the brain in, interacts with its environment. Um, and so uh, uh, a lot of work has been um, done in the visual system because it's a kind of an easy system to, to uh, probe. Uh, so you put somebody in a scanner or you put on electrodes on their brain. Um, and you try to measure their responses when they uh, are, are shown an image. 
Um, and so the visual areas in the brain um, consist of like early visual areas. So on the left here, you can see it, that this is the back of the brain, the occipital cortex, and you can see these kind of early visual areas that deal with low level features and images, um, things like textures or form or motion. Um, and they relay these signals to higher order visual processing areas that then um, interpret people's pla uh, either places or faces, visual words, other people's thoughts or, or bodies. And these were discovered um, mostly by uh, viewing images of similar features or content, uh, noticing that the activation in these areas were greater than uh, greater in when seeing certain images um, compared to others. Um, and of course, discovery of these areas is restricted in the way that we have classically done it because you can only identify them by scanning a person while they're viewing these pre-selected images. Um, and these pre-selected images are by nature gonna be limited by our imaginations uh, and or the content of, or features of available images. Um, so, you know, if there's a region that represents uh, a dog riding a bicycle, <laughs> then we're probably never gonna be able to test for that because we don't, aren't gonna be showing people a bunch of images of a dog riding a bicycle. Uh, yeah, so, so, so there are some limitations to this type of approach. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, artificial neural networks have attempted to model the, the, this uh, simple neuronal system, this biological neuron um, that is capable of such complexity. And uh, we, they've had some successes in developing ways uh, of performing tests classically that, that are classically difficult for computers, including image recognition or predictions based on past knowledge. Um, but obviously they're nowhere near the capability of the human brain. Um, and here we have kind of a, a mirror of the biological neuron and the, the computational uh, artificial neuron where these dendrites are represented um, in the artificial neuron as inputs from the previous layer. And the cell body uh, here is the node in the artificial neural network. And the axon here is the output from the node. And then the synapses are the connections and the interconnections between the layers in the artificial network. Okay, so uh, the original artificial neural network called the Perceptron is a single layer ANN, um, was actually invented by Frank Rosenblatt in the 50s for the US Navy. Um, it was originally intended to be a specialized hardware um, that was designed to mimic how the brain learns. And it was first used in an image classification task. I found this really interesting uh, clip from a documentary that I'm gonna play. In the 1950s and 60s, scientists built a few working perceptrons, as these artificial brains were called. He's using it to explore the mysterious problem of how the brain learns. This perceptron is being trained to recognize the difference between males and females. It is something that all of us can do easily, but few of us can explain how. To get a computer to do this would involve working out many complex rules about faces, and writing a computer program. But this perceptron was simply given lots and lots of examples, including some with unusual hairstyles. But when it comes to a beetle, the computer looks at facial features and hair outline and takes longer to learn what it's told by Dr. Taylor. Andrew Cruikshank's wig also causes a little heart searching. After training on lots of examples, it's given new faces it has never seen and is able to successfully distinguish male from female. It has learned. While promising, this approach to machine intelligence virtually died out. So I love the end of this clip uh, uh, that it virtually died out. Um, <laughs> so if only he could see uh, today. Uh, yeah. So uh, so that, that was a uh, kind of a, that was the, origin of the artificial neural network. Um, and of course we all know today that it's being used in uh, many different tasks um, from computer vision to predictions of uh, you know, diagnosis and, and medical um, applications and things like that. So uh, one of the applications uh, that has been used for frequently is modeling biological neural networks. Um, and so this one is actually an example of an encoding um, or decoding model. Uh, um, and here you have the biological neural network um, that you know is is the human brain, and we give it a, an image, and we see how the brain responds. Um, so we record the activity in the different regions of the brain in response to a particular image. 
Um, and then we try to reconstruct the how the brain um, processes this information with a with an artificial neural network um, that can take the image, extract relevant features, and then do some sort of prediction of the content um, or predict the actual brain activation itself. Um, and so uh, you can also go that so that's an that's what we call an encoding model. Um, but you can also go the other direction where you look at the person's brain activity and you try to um, infer what they're seeing. Um, so that's called decoding. Um, and so encoding and decoding are, are, are um, prolific and there's a lot of research going on in, in performing encoding and decoding. Um, and there's actually this really uh, interesting recent uh, 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 paper preprint on BioArchive, Look, it's called brainscore.org. Um, and you can actually give this website your artificial neural network and it will tell you how similar it is to a biological one um, by looking at the responses of different layers and how similar they are to uh, the regional activations in human brains um, to different stimuli. So this is kind of an interesting way of uh, uh, looking at the similarity between artificial and biological neural networks. Um, so uh, one recent paper that we that our group has uh, uh, published in Science Advances um, was looking at an encoding model for video. Um, so here we actually had um, data from the Human Connectome Project. Um, so this was seven Tesla data um, that was, uh, I think about 150-ish people who had watched four videos, uh, four, four movie clips. Um, and so what we did there was we tried a, a bunch of different encoding models um, using uh, either a, a short duration of um, either the video or the audio um, as input. Um, then we combined the, the audio and visual input together um, and, and used only a very short duration of the inputs um, into the model. And then we uh, looked at using uh, extending the duration of the uh, video, the inputs, um, and used a 20 second uh, model of either audio or visual. Um, and then finally together, we, we combined all of the modalities, the audio and visual, and, and also extended our time window to be uh, 20 seconds long. Um, and so we, we kind of compared uh, and contrasted these different um, encoding models of brain activity from watching a movie. Um, and so here there's actually, uh, this is the regional predictive accuracy for the, the holdout test movie. Um, and here you can see, this is just a visualization of the groups that were representing with the box plots. Um, the accuracy of the block plots. Uh, and so you can see um, that uh, the visual areas, um, for example, uh, so the green is the multimodal uh, encoding model accuracy. Uh, the, the pinks are the um, single modality audio models. And then the rights, are, the blue are the visual only models. And you can see like, for example, for the visual regions, the multimodal model does just as well as the visual model. So that's not surprising because the visual areas are gonna be uh, more related to the visual input than the audio input. The auditory areas are again the similar, uh, where the audio auditory uh, model only models do as well as the multimodal models. Um, and then we see uh, frontal areas, the higher order areas. That's where you really get um, some uh, accuracy boosts from using multimodal information. Um, and so, so this is kind of a, of a way of um, understanding how the uh, regions of the brain are specifically um, tuned to different types of stimuli. Uh, and then we, we visualized this accuracy uh, um, for visual, you know, audio, audio only models, visual only models and multimodal models um, together. And you can see that overall the audio models were actually much easier uh, and we had an easier time predicting the response in these different regions uh, using auditory only stimuli than visual stimuli um, in, in the auditory regions. And we think, we hypothesized that maybe this was due to the fact that people are looking in different areas um, of the, of the uh, video. Um, when they're uh, um, watching the movie, uh, but then the audio is the same for all of the people who are uh, listening to the video. So it could be just a matter of the um, location of the vision. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that was all I wanted to say about that one. Um, and then we also looked at the influence of the, of the history, the temporal history. So we had this one second um, encoding model and then a 20 second encoding model that incorporated all the information from the previous 20 seconds. Um, and you can actually see that the early auditory regions don't benefit much from extension of the, the window of time, um, but the associated
association and higher order areas um, do benefit from incorporating uh, longer periods of time uh, from the stimuli. Um, and so this is another interesting thing where, you know, that we are showing basically that the early um, auditory areas uh, and early visual areas are, are more locked to the very uh, acute um, time point stimuli, whereas the association ones are incorporating and integrating information over time. Um, and we also did some uh, sensitivity analysis of the ROIs to the different sensory inputs by shuffling the visual or shuffling the audio uh, inputs and looking at the change in accuracy of the encoding model. Um, and so you can see we have them arranged here from uh, auditory to visual. Um, and you can see that when you shuffle the audio for the auditory regions, you get a, a drastic drop in the accuracy. Um, and whereas if you uh, shuffle the visual for the visual regions, you get a drastic uh, drop in accuracy. And here we have uh, just a representation of the um, kind of preference of each of the regions to the, the auditory versus visual stimuli. And it, it of course lines up with what we know about the visual system and the auditory system. Uh, and we also looked at um, using this encoding model as a virtual brain activity synthesizer. So here we actually um, looked at neurogen, uh, uh, neurosynth um, and, and neurosynth and we, and we put in uh, a contrast for, I think it was uh, faces and places um, for, for neuro, oh, speech for neurosynth, yeah. Um, and then we looked at the overlap uh, of, of the uh, speech kind of areas. Um, with uh, 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 synthesized um, activation from our encoding model. Um, and it does seem like there's quite a bit of overlap of the two. Um, uh, it, basically, we're saying that we can use this encoding model to synthesize contrast maps. Um, and, and we did the same thing for the HCP task contrast uh, maps for, for language and faces and places. Um, and, and we basically see a very good overlap of um, our synthesized contrast maps with um, the actual contrast maps from other, other data sets. Okay, uh, so let me switch gears to a, a different set of experiments that we've been doing recently. Um, and so maybe some of you are familiar with this as well. Uh, so these are generative adversarial networks. Um, so uh, one big task in artificial neural networks is to classify the content of images. Um, and uh, obviously this is for used in computer vision and uh, um, automated uh, driving, for example. Um, and uh, there's this uh, kind of um, Achilles heel where you can actually tweak an image with just a few pixels and cause it to change its classification. So, so this is kind of uh, called, called an adversarial example. Um, and so one way to uh, try to combat this is to use generative adversarial networks that synthesize images um, that then are used in a discriminator to determine if they're fake or, or real. Um, and there are many different applications of these GANs. Um, one of them is, you know, taking a zebra and making it look like a horse, uh, making it classified as a horse, uh, taking a, an image of a, a summer landscape and changing it to a different season. Um, and then there's also some really interesting ones where you can, uh, you know, change a, a, an image of a dog into, I guess this is a pheasant of some sort. Um, and so there's lots of interesting examples uh, of using synthetic images um, and, and applications of these synthetic images. So there's, there's also this other one where you could actually input text and get out synthetic images that were supposed to be reflective of that text. Um, and there's there's even a video GAN, um, so this was created recently um, using YouTube videos. Uh, it's, they're kind of a little bit disturbing, I think, but um, they're just clips that are you know, maximally categorized as some certain category. Um, and you can kind of see some things that may be suggestive of, you know, for example, somebody brushing a horse or somebody cutting a, a ham or something like that. Um, but, they're, but they are synthetic and you can tell that they are synthetic. Um, but there's a lot of work recently uh, looking at uh, these types of approaches to synthesizing images. Um, some really interesting work. Uh, so this is uh, work from uh, Ponce et al. in 2019. Um, and here what they did was they were actually doing single cell neural recording um, and they were in real time um, optimizing images using a genetic algorithm um, to selectively maximize firing in a specific neuron. Um, and so here you can actually see the generation of this optimization procedure where it starts out as some, uh, you know, some amorphous blob of color, uh, and then it kind of morphs into maybe something that looks like a face. Um, and so I, I will show you a video now of the, of the generation of those images. 
Um, so this is for a, a very this is for a specific neuron, RI10, um, in a specific monkey. And you can see that it starts out as some uh, kind of black, uh, maybe gray scale image, and then it kind of morphs into a uh, face. Um, and, the, and the second one also, uh, so this is another neuron. Um, and you can see that there, there are um, some natural, so they have the, uh, the responses and the, the fraction of images is a histogram um, of the response or the spikes per second. Um, and you can see they have some natural images that have low responses and some uh, natural images that have high responses. And those natural images that have high responses also do look very similar to the synthetic images that give maximal responses. Um, so you can see they're both monkeys here um, on the right that give a very high spike rate. Um, and here you can actually see, I, I think this is probably a caregiver, um, somebody with a, with a mask and a face shield on. Um, and that also the natural image sort of looks similar to that. So, so they were able to actually tune these um, images to achieve firing rates in these specific neurons that are above and beyond uh, what was achievable in their natural images. So um, enter our work. Um, so we, we actually collaborated with uh, um, Kendra Kay and Tom Nazalaris on this natural scenes data set. So this is a preprint that I think will be published soon, um, but it was a, a massive effort. So they had eight subjects who came in uh, 30 to 40 times to get an fMRI scan um, over the course of a year. Um, and they were shown between 20 and 30,000 images. Um, some of them were repeated across the individuals and there was a thousand, a set of a thousand that were um, common across the individuals, but all the rest were, were um, disjoint. Um, and they were asked to fixate on the center of the image and um, perform an atten uh, attention task where they uh, would press them they had seen an image before. So it was kind of a, a task uh, driven um, uh, paradigm so that they would pay attention basically to the to the images. Um, and and uh, these were all natural images. Um, so they were not, uh, uh, you know, typical and they were just typical um, natural scenes of indoors, outdoors, faces, animals, things like that. So they were they were all natural images. Um, so this data set was really interesting. So it's eight subjects. So what we did was we took um, the subject data and we created encoding models for each individual. Um, and so here we use a, a feature weighted receptive field map, uh, a receptive field model, um, where we take the image, we feed it through AlexNet to extract features. Um, and then we use these features in a regression model to predict regional activation. And we chose um, 24 different visual regions. Um, and these 24 regions were identified on a subject-wise basis using a functional localizer um, scan whose where the images and the responses um, were used in, in a contrast way to find these regions that fire, like for example, for specifically for faces. Um, so, uh, so, and those images were not used in the training of the, of the subsequent encoding model. So here are some of the results. Uh, so these are the violin plots of the correlation between predicted and true for that holdout set of 1000 that was common across all the subjects. And you can see there's wide variability in the accuracy, um, but in general, this is usually the amount of accuracy that's seen in visual uh, regions, responses in humans um, at a macro scale level. Um, and so here you, you can see the, the correlation between predicted and true for some average uh, regions, uh, or for average uh, um, images. Um, so we kind of compiled them uh, to see that when you um, kind of average uh, images that have a similar activation response, predicted activation response, you get uh, even higher correlations. Um, so it seems like the encoding model is smoothing out some noise as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, there's also five general categories of these visual areas. Uh, face regions, so regions that selectively respond to faces, um, regions that selectively respond to bodies, um, places, uh, written words, and early visual ROIs. So these are, these are all regions that were identified using this functional localizer task. So then what we decided to do was use a genetic, uh, a generative framework um, to create synthetic images that were um, designed to achieve some certain target brain response. Uh, and so here, we used a generative model called Big Gan Deep. Um, and what this is, is a conditional gener generator. 
Um, and so you actually have to provide a class um, out of their, I think they have about a thousand categories of images. Um, so you provide it a category of image and it can create um, a synthetic image that is um, classified as that category um, based on some noise vector. And so what we did here was we, we you know, said, gave uh, our encoding model some target um, ROI response that we wanted to achieve. Um, and then we actually were able to optimize the noise vector um, and the classes, so we took uh, some noise vectors, passed them through the, the generator, created an image for each of the classes, and then we identified the top 10 classes that gave us the best match to that target our regional response. And then we then further optimized the noise vector to give us the best, uh, most accurate matching response to what we required, what we wanted to uh, uh, achieve. Um, and so one example of that is just maximizing the activity in a single target region. Um, and so here I, I just have like a reminder of what the regions are generally faces, places, word forms, um, word form areas uh, and, and uh, um, uh, early visual, which is response to like texture and things like that early uh, low level features. So some results. Uh, so here I will show you for um, a specific subject and a specific region the top 10 images from the actual responses in the fMRI data that gave us maximal activation in that particular area. Um, and then we have the top 10 images that give us the maximal predicted activation from the encoding model. And then we have our synthetic images from our framework that we call Neurogen. So that was the fusiform face area. So you can see generally that um, there are faces in these images that are maximally firing the fusiform here, which is good to uh, expect. Um, there are some unexpected things like, uh, you know, kids playing soccer um, or a dog or uh, a monkey. Um, however, the, the synthetic images seem to be like groups of people or, or very close up images of faces. And there's, there is a dog here too. Uh, body areas, again, you can see that the natural images, there's maybe some inconsistencies like this um, zebra. I'm not sure why that's there. Uh, and then in the coding model, you have a little bit smoother. Um, you've smoothed out the noise a bit. So you do see some better consistency across those top 10 images. Um, and then of course, in, in Neurogen, you see, you see mostly bodies, um, except for a duck here, which we have a hypothesis about, but I, I will, we'll get into that today. Uh, okay, and then we also have a representation of the top 10 images using a word cloud. Um, so of course, in uh, the face area, you can see person is dominant. Um, in the body, area, you can see also person is dominant, but, but also things like uh, baseball bat or sports ball or baseball glove, things that are, that are having to deal with um, active bodies in sports. Uh, so another example is this parahippocampal place area. So you see generally places. Um, and again, these are synthetic images of places. They do look pretty real, I think, uh, for the places especially. Um, and then for word areas, you see some of the um, encoding model giving you maybe food, some food, uh, there's a donut there. Uh, whereas the synthetic neurogen images, you see uh, you know, things that have words on them normally. Uh, so things like billboards or um, bot bottles of uh, some drinks um, or even an od odometer with uh, numbers on it. Um, and then of course, when we look at early visual areas, we see high frequency texture um, and, that's, and that abounds in the, in the synthetic images as well. Uh, if we look at the word clouds, we see some you know, consistencies across the different um, top 10 images um, for a pair hippocampal place area. You see things like chair and sink and dining table. Um, for things like words, we see uh, for the synthetic images, book, which is really good. <laughs> uh, and, and also, but for the natural encoding, we see things that are more food related maybe. Um, uh, so it may be not as uh, obvious there. Um, and then in V1V for the early, early uh, visual high frequency texture, we see a, a, a consistency um, uh, with, with book and, and some of the food items. Um, and so uh, one thing we wanted to test was if the predicted activation for the synthetic images was greater than the predicted natural, um, the predicted activation from the natural. And we do see that that is true. Um, so we see a significant uh, 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 increase in the predicted activation for the synthetic images compared to the best natural images. 
Um, so we have uh, uh, shown that the predictions are true, but we are currently planning right now um, our prospective data collection to test to see if these synthetic images do actually achieve activation above and beyond what's uh, um, uh, possible with the natural images. So uh, one interesting thing that we noticed with our results um, was that we could actually, um, because of the smoothing thing that the encoding model provides, um, we were able to um, create synthetic images um, that were uh, consistent and, and possibly um, able to better uh, tell us what uh, images or, feature con or features or content um, would, activate, would maximally activate different regions in the brain. Um, and so uh, the first thing that we noticed, uh, so this is a sub eight subjects. So these are all eight subjects on the left side here. We have the top 10 images for the uh, uh, OFA, which is a face area. Um, and on the right, we have the synthetic images. And so you can see um, uh, the natural images that have the highest predicted activation for the OFA. Um, there are a lot of human faces, but there's some other things like, um, you know, horses or a stoplight um, or a clock. So there's some inconsistencies there. Um, in the synthetic images on the right, you see a lot of human faces, but you also see a plethora of dogs. Uh, so this is kind of interesting to us. Um, and there's been work before that has shown that um, human face areas uh, respond to human faces, but they also respond to mammal faces. Um, it, but it, they did say, it, it, the previous work has shown that they respond mostly to human faces more than um, uh, animal faces. Um, and so it was interesting to see that there are some individuals um, that do have uh, uh, more dogs than others. So for example, this person only had a couple of dogs in their top 10 images, whereas this person had all dogs in their top 10 images. So there seems to be also some individual variability in the responses um, uh, in this dog human preference. Um, and the fMRI images, uh, the top 10 fMRI images are obviously very noisy. There are some faces, but there's other things in there too that don't really make sense. And it's, it's mostly because of the noise in the fMRI signal. Um, and this was also another face area. And again, we see a similar pattern where um, mostly we have human faces uh, for the encoding model, some, some noise possibly. Um, but the synthetic images, you see a pattern again emerging where you have some people that respond more to dogs, uh, dog faces or animal faces than, than humans. Um, and so we wanted to test this. Uh, and then uh, there are other um, face areas that actually seem like there are more humans um, in them than dogs. And so we actually wanted to test um, and yeah, this is a word cloud plot uh, showing that, yeah, there's this obviously this sort of um, dog uh, prevalence in, in the face regions. And so our first thought was actually <laughs> idiosyncrasy of uh, GANs and, and uh, GANs are built on certain sets of images. And the one we were using actually has quite a bit of categories for dogs. Um, so out of the thousand categories, I think there are maybe about a hundred that are dogs. Um, and so we thought maybe it was just a a byproduct of the fact that we had a lot of dogs in our synthetic uh, image uh, set um, in our gener generative network. Um, and so we sought to test if it was actually true that this dog human preference was being reflected in our synthetic images. So what we decided to do was actually do a, a, a t, t test, just a standard t test between images um, in the actual NSD data that had dogs versus images that had uh, the, uh, that were images of people. Um, so this is the, each of these points represents a different region for a, a particular subject. Um, and you can see, and, and these are all face regions. Um, and you can see uh, on the X axis here, this is the tick of the dog activation versus the person activation for a large set of thousands of images. And you can see that there's a correlation um, and there exists a, a significant correlation with the dog person ratio of our top 10 synthetic images. Um, and so it was, it was a moderate to strong correlation that we saw. If we extended our synthetic images to not just the top 10 categories, but the top 100 categories, we see an even stronger correlation of this dog person preference. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, it, it, this dog preference may be uh, able to be detected better by our generative network because of the prevalence of dogs, but it does exist in actual data. Um, so it's not something that's just a spurious artifact. 
and so another interesting um, uh, set of results that we found were for uh, the word form areas. Um, so the word form areas are pretty interesting because they're actually uh, very, they vary quite a bit over the population because they are uh, dependent on experience. Um, and so the face areas are things I, I, I think that, and you know, people have proposed that are, are more important evolutionarily. And so they're more uh, uh, consistent across the population um, and they're more consistently uh, in the same locations and they um, respond more consistently across individuals. Um, but the word form areas are, are things that are dependent on experience. Um, and we see in some of these word form areas um, that there are some things that do contain text or words like clocks or watches or bottle caps or, um, you know, particularly in this subject, we actually see quite a bit of um, things that contain words, including uh, book jackets or uh, scoreboards or things like that. Uh, but then there's others that have, you know, some, some dogs or some uh, people's faces and things like that, or, or even things that maybe have similar texture, like they're round um, or have similar coloring. Um, and so, uh, we also see in different, in other word form areas, there are some people who have a very strong preference and it, it appears a strong preference for food um, in their synthetic images um, and actually in their natural images as well uh, for this word form area and others that have more preference for human bodies. Um, and, and so there seems to be a wide variability um, across the population in these word form areas, which is, is not totally unexpected. So we decided to do a similar approach uh, to our dog versus human kind of contrast. Um, and here we actually, uh, we, we chose six categories, um, person, dog, bird, other animal, food, and clock. Um, and, and even across this wide range of categories in image content, we do see some correlations with the underlying preference um, from, the, from the natural images and from the actual responses in the natural images. So up until now, I've just been talking about activation maximization in a single region, um, but this approach can also be applied in pairs of regions or uh, you know, an arbitrary number of regions. Um, and so what we, uh, first a uh, couple of experiments that we did, we, um, op we set out to either maximize two regions together to maximize one and minimize the other um, or to minimize both. I don't have to minimize both here, but uh, in any case, here we have um, the images for a particular subject that maximize the fusiform face area. And again, you can see uh, prevalence of dogs and human faces. Um, and then we have an, a, a set of images that maximizes early visual, which are high frequency textures generally are what the V1V responds to. Um, and they don't generally contain human faces. Um, actually, don't, none of them contain human faces. But if we maximize both the fusiform face area and V1V, we actually see kind of a combination of the two where we have some high frequency texture, but also some people uh, in the images themselves. Um, so you can see that this is clearly, uh, is um, kind of a validation of what, what our approach would be. Um, if we maximize the face area and minimize texture, you actually see that it takes, it, it creates those uh, human faces or human bodies, um, but it flattens out the, the texture in the background or even in the, in the person themselves. Um, and then of course, if you maximize just V1V and you minimize for people, you, you get close-ups of high frequency texture food. Um, so this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, a similar thing uh, occurred for our periodical place area and V1V. So again, you see place areas, high frequency texture, then high frequency texture plus places, and then low frequency uh, or uh, flat texture and places. Um, and this was a bit surprising when you maximize V1V and minimize places, you actually get close-ups of animals, it seems, uh, but they do have high frequency texture um, and they're, they're not really place images, they're images of, of animals. Uh, so one more, more complicated thing, instead of just a early visual, that's a late visual, if you look at two late visual area uh, regions together, um, we see that uh, there are um, combinations of the two. So you have places without people, close-ups of people, and then when you maximize both, you get um, people in set in places. Um, so these are some interesting results. Uh, for words and textures, you see a similar thing where the, the texture kind of disappears, and, but the words remain. Um, when you maximize for words and minimize for textures and for both maximizations, um, you do see things like scoreboards or, or book jackets or packets um, that have words and high frequency texture. 
So we also wanted to test if there were significant differences between the predicted synthetic and the predicted natural activations. Um, and we do see for the, for the most part uh, that there are significantly more extreme activations for the synthetic images than compared to the natural. There were a few that were not significant, um, but for the most part, we did have some significant um, differences in the activation patterns uh, uh, for the dual region optimization. Um, so I'm just going to skip through these. And so this is an interesting representation of the of the um, experiment I just showed, um, where we have on the uh, uh, x-axis the FFA activation and on the y-axis the V1V uh, activation. And you can see that the natural images are being represented in this orange, and then the blue are the synthetic images predicted activations. And you can see that they are um, generally more extreme uh, at the edges of this kind of um, circle than the natural images themselves. We also uh, attempted a three region um, art, uh, optimization. And here we used FFA, PPA, and V1V. Um, and here, this is a representation in 3D of the uh, triplets uh, of the activation for, for each of the um, synthetic images in blue and the natural images in orange again, and some examples. Um, and so you can see if you uh, minimize the activation in FFA, PPA, and V1V, you actually get a flat texture of maybe a parachute or a bird in flight, um, something that doesn't have a face and is generally not really a placey as well. Um, and so that was kind of an interesting uh, result. Um, and we also see when you maximize all three of them together, you do see faces and a, in, set in a place with high frequency texture. So it seems to me that this uh, optimization uh, approach uh, using the synthetic images seems to be, to be working. Um, but again, we will be testing this in our, our future applications um, uh, in, in showing people the actual synthetic images and comparing their activations against the natural images that are predicted to be the best match to that target as well. So to bring it back around, <laughs> so I, I told you when I started this talk that I was going to hopefully bring it back around to what I actually am trying to do, which is to help the brain recover from injury. Um, and so uh, hopefully I've convinced you that it, it could be possible to um, uh, uh, achieve a specific target activation in the, in the brain, at least in the visual regions with, with, uh, sti with visual stimuli. Um, and you could use this approach as a discovery architecture. Um, we've shown that the synthetic images that are generated in this activation maximization or minimization scheme do reflect underlying data. Um, and they do summarize these regional response maps um, that they're per preferentially activated for um, in just a few images. Um, and it could be used to identify new regions that correspond to certain images uh, uh, with feature and content of a specific type. Um, and you could actually possibly create these images to achieve arbitrary activation patterns. Um, and these um, Synthetic images have predictions, uh, predicted activations that are more extreme than natural images. So we're going to test that in future, in the future. And if it's if it does turn out that we can activate them above and beyond natural images, we might be able to use them in a neuromodulatory capacity. Um, and and specifically, we are thinking about the amygdala. Um, so the amygdala is a brain region that responds to visual stimuli. Um, specifically to, you know, faces or extreme emotion in faces. Um, and it is also something that's central to neuropsychiatric diseases like depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's a lot of work recently looking at using real-time neural feedback to suppress activation in the amygdala or to activate the amygdala. Um, and uh, if you could use these images to achieve the same thing, you could actually do it outside of the scanner. You wouldn't have to be inside of the scanner for that to, um, for this neuromodulation to happen. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, I, the far future idea of using this approach for, for neuromodulation and possibly, um, you know, the far future experiment number two is to, or three is to show um, that repeated uh, uh, presentation of these synthetic images that achieve a certain uh, level of activity in, in particular regions can actually cause changes to the functional connectome, which may be um, related to a person's behavior or, or a pathology. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my Coco Lab and uh, my funding sources. Amy, this was a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much for this. <laughs> no problem. It was the first time I've kind of presented it, so I was a little bit uh, nervous about it. So <laughs> it's, it's really great. Uh, I, I enjoyed this presentation so much. There's so many really bright ideas and really, really interesting work. This is really amazing what you're doing. 
and I'm very, very glad that you presented it to us. So this yeah, is yeah, I'm I'm happy to. This is really cool. Thank you so much. It's really awesome work. It, it's it's really awesome work. So I have a couple. I, I do have a couple of questions. And um, would you like me to stop sharing? Or uh, you, you, yeah, I think you can stop sharing because they're more like um, uh, probably can be explained very well with words. Um, so the I think the 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 temporal results that you've been showing this is very this is really amazing. Uh, so what what are the main challenges to to get that done in a in a manner that you actually get a generated image that or video sequence that that's actually usable um this is i think that's very hard right so what what are the key ingredients to make that work that is the sequence of images actually works yeah so i think the student uh just basically took some uh you know down basically downsampled the the video to some and, and took like you know the the certain things from i don't remember what the uh window between the frames was um but basically i, I maybe it was one every second I'm, i'm not actually sure what they did which you did exactly um I I, uh, but i think it was like one frame per second for the previous 20 seconds Yeah. I see. So, so you use a, a temporal downsampling in order to get yes. consistency yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. cool, cool, a very cool strategy. So, also the the gun structure. So, when you when you're using a gun to generate something, then I think that the the structure and also the training data plays a crucial role. Mm -hmm. uh, did you recognize any influence by the gun and um, how is that compared to other inversion techniques that are mo like model free and only use yeah. reverse polarization? So the reason we chose the conditional GAN was because we were hoping to create images that were sort of maybe more natural. Um, I'm not sure if this is uh, exactly true, but we thought if we could provide a category for the image. And also within this big and deep, there's like a tuning parameter that you can uh, modify to make the image more natural or to create more diverse, diverse images. Um, and so we tried to find a sweet spot that gave us sort of images that did look sort of natural. <laughs> I mean, some of those images don't look natural, but exactly natural, but they do look natural-ish, uh, I would say. Um, because our future work was going to be to show people these images in the scanner. And I don't know if something that's so far from natural that's based on an encoding model of natural images would be like the, the prediction would be accurate, right? So if you have these images that are so far from the natural images that the encoding model was trained on, it might be, not be so accurate in its, in its prediction of what actually the, the brain is going to do in response. Um, so we did want to try to make the images sort of as natural as possible, but also not restrict it to, you know, being um, um, something that wasn't going to activate the, the region that we wanted to activate. And for other inversion techniques, then you probably also need to know much more about the network and so on, right? And, and yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you could, we could use different GANs and, and we actually, we started looking into that um, because we have an interest. I, I, I mentioned there at the end, we have an interest in the amygdala um, and the amygdala, it's kind of up in the air exactly what it responds to, but it, it's generally thought to respond to like extreme emotion. Um, and so uh, there it might be better to use a, face specific GAN, right? Mm -hmm. So something that um, can generate uh, uh, faces more in, in a more detailed manner. Um, mm -hmm. And for, for the GAN that you've been showing and the real images, is, is this all sampled from ImageNet or? Um, yes, I think, yeah, they're all ImageNet images. They're all yeah. ImageNet. And so again, the, the dogs are, <laughs> there's a lot of dogs, uh, which is another reason, you know, that, that was, one of the things that we thought about when we saw these dogs were like, oh, it's just because there's lots of dogs in ImageNet and it, they just want to make, you know, wants to make image uh, images of dogs. But I mean, we found that it was related to a person's actual preferences for, for mm -hmm. dogs versus humans. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there may be also a couple other things like uh, the natural scenes data set, those natural images, when it's an image of a dog, it's more likely to be a close up of a dog's face. Uh, than, than an image of a person, which could be like far away. So we, we tried to pick, when we did that T-stat um, of the actual responses to the actual natural images in the NSD data set, we tried to filter them so that we got like 
the best close-ups of dogs' faces and the best close-ups of human faces. But of course, it's harder to to do that for for humans for whatever reason in that data set. Um, so it could just be a, a byproduct of that as well. So we've, we've thought about how to try to figure that out um, with future work. But. Yeah, absolutely. No, but it's, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, uh, to show a lot of these results. Uh, so when you generate the, the images, um, I would expect that, you know, that if you optimize for a certain area or, or a neuron or something like that, that you may generate many very similar um, images that all get a very high uh, activation in that particular area. So is, do you do anything to prevent that? Or do you just get it from good random initializations? Or do you have some... Yeah, so so the that? ones that I was showing, um, this is another benefit of the conditional GAN, is that we took the top 10 classes that gave us the maximal activation. So we actually have some heterogeneity already that exists because we are selecting for different classes. Um, and then we fine tune that way vector each of those 10 classes. Um, but you can imagine if, you, you know, maybe there's one category that gives you, and if you had different noise vectors, it might give you something sort of variable variable in that one category. But we wanted to have some diversity in our top 10 images. So we, we chose to use that conditional um, GAN and then pick the top 10 categories that were often different, but um, sort of similar, like, uh, you know, some of those face areas that they were um, like ice lolly, like a like a popsicle or mortarboard. Uh, so that they were kind of a necktie. That was another popular one for the face areas. Um, so they're actually like ca the categories were not things that were like faces. They weren't like human face, but they were things that were associated with human faces like hat or something like that. Yeah. It really interesting, really interesting. So um, let, let, let's play a bit uh, Elon Musk. Uh, do, do you think with these methods, you could then finally also do like um, produce like, like surrogate signal uh, or surrogate modules for the brain if a certain area is, is injured? Do you think if you had uh, sufficient detail of the, of the brain and uh, sufficient compute power and uh, wonderful tools would could really connect? Do you think something like that would be possible to really repair a broken, a, a destroyed brain part? I, so I, I don't think you could repair like a destroyed brain part, um, but you could, I think, reorganize, right? So you could, you could potentially uh, recruit intact brain. Like, so this is what generally the brain does when it's damaged. Uh, uh, if you have enough intact brain left over, uh, your brain will try to recruit areas that are not damaged um, to take over the damaged areas um, uh, function. Um, and so uh, there's been a lot of work looking at how a brain recovers in like natural um, uh, uh, injury, like so, you know, after stroke or traumatic brain injury or things like that. Um, and how it might reorganize. And then the idea that, you know, we're trying to pursue is that if you can identify how the brain re reorganizes itself to compensate for, for some damage, that you might be able to support that mechanism using non-invasive brain stimulation like TMS or TDCS or even therapy that like specifically targets um, a certain pathway or something like that. Um, and so uh, using, so, so the idea that I had for this in the far, far future is that if you could say for a stroke subject, identify that a functional connection needs to be reestablished, um, you could potentially design an image that fires those two regions together. And then after enough firing together, it's been shown that those regions can become more functionally connected. Um, and so you could possibly use it in a neuromodulatory context. However, there's, you know, there's not a ton of evidence. There's a little bit of evidence, but there's not a ton of evidence that when you fire something together frequently that it will always, you know, functionally connect. Um, there is a little bit of evidence with like concurrent TMS where you have two coils that are firing simultaneously and they, and they sort of il elicit a functional connection that wasn't there before. But um, who knows if it would be possible with, with images or even, yeah. <laughs> Amy, I must admit, this was a wonderful presentation. It was super <laughs> inspiring and also oh, I'm glad. really great for us to, to see what the methods could be pay, uh, capable of doing in the future. So absolutely visionary and brilliant. Thank you very much for this presentation. No problem. It was my pleasure. So, uh, I hope you can hear the applause. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's knocking on the table. That you oh, great. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. 
Yeah, I told you this is going to be a really exciting talk. So you see what she showed was really inspiring. I absolutely loved her presentation and also the many exciting research ideas that she was showing. So of course, this doesn't have to end our discussion. So we had a couple of questions in the video. If you do have additional questions, you can ask them in the comments below this video or you can also get in contact with us on social media and then we can resolve your remaining questions or comments. So if you're interested, please contact us directly. Thank you very much for watching this and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you again in one of the next episodes of Beyond the Patterns.